Sectoral studies. Sectoral studies. Oh, we, we need uh, some mm -hmm. operator. We need operator. Okay, welcome to this uh, afternoon, our first uh, session three, which is uh, foresight sectoral studies. So um, we should start uh, because we want to save the time. So please, the first speaker is Jose. Uh, so are you ready? Yes. Okay. Yes, um, so good afternoon. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the universe, energy, and uh, Nikolai Kardashev, who was one of the greatest scientists, I think, and he just passed away last August. Um, very, very sad uh, that we lost him. Um, I work with the Millennium Project, and I coordinate the group in Latin America. And uh, as you know, we publish every year a report that we translate in several languages, like you can see there in Chinese, and we publish the futures research methodology, and also, we just did one study about work and technology scenarios in the year 2050. Um, but I want to focus on this great Russian scientist, Nikolai Kardashev, that about half a, half a century ago, he devised the energy scale of the universe as we understood the universe half a century ago. He basically talked about three different types of civilizations, um, which were divided by the amount of solar energy that they could uh, Hardness. The first one, a planet. The second one, the star or the solar system. And the third one at the time when he was writing was the galaxy. Remember, half a century ago, we did not know really how big the universe was, if it was expanding, if it was contracting. We didn't know about dark energy. We didn't know about uh, dark matter. So all these things came later. But Nikolai Kardashev, he talked about three different types of civilization. Uh, in terms of the energy content, um, uh, a scale one civilization, a planet civilization, was in the order of 10 to the 16 watts. Um, a type two civilization, which is a solar system, was 10 to the 26 uh, watts. And a type three civilization was above 10 to the 36 watts. So you see that there is a lot of energy in the universe. And we humans in this small planet, we only use a very, very small amount of energy. Um, after he proposed these ideas, people be began talking about a fourth type of civilization could, could, that could be a, um, a cluster of galaxies, and then even a, a type five civilization that could be the whole universe, and maybe even more if we think about multiverses. We don't know how much energy there is in the universe, but it is really incredibly a lot of energy. Um, so for the people who were talking about uh, type four civilization, a cluster of galaxies that is 10 to the 46 watts. Uh, we could then become the energy seniors of the universe with this incredible amounts of uh, solar power. Um, Nikolai Kardashev was trying to uh, measure all this uh, energy. And here I have some examples. For example, a human brain. A human brain is basically a machine of 30 watts. A human body is about 100 watts. Uh, that means like that the brain is really energy intensive compared to the other part of the body. Uh, the largest dam and hydroelectric facility in the planet, which is the Three Gorges Dam in China, is 18 gigawatts. Actually, this is power. It's not energy. There is a time factor in between. The whole planet Earth in the year 2001 was about 13.5 uh, uh, terawatts. A terawatt is 10 to the 12 watts. 
A type one civilization would be 174 petawatts. A petawatt, as you can see, there is 10 to the 18. A type two civilization, which would be the energy, solar energy generated by, by our star, the sun, uh, a type three civilization, our galaxy, the Milky Way, a type four civilization, the cluster of galaxies where we are, and a type, civiliz type five civilization, all of the known universe today, which is in the order of 10 to the 56 watts. So you see, we are really, really tiny compared to the amount of energy we have in the universe. Um, my friend um, Ray Kurzweil popularized the idea of the technological singularity, which is a time when artificial intelligence reaches human intelligence level. Uh, my other friend Aubrey de Grey, he popularized the idea of the Methuselarity, which is the singularity of Methuselah, the time when we will become basically immortal or we will be able to live indefinitely. And, um, over 10 years ago, I created the idea of the energularity. The energularity is the time when we will become a type one civilization. And this will happen in the next few decades. Um, if you look at the energy outlook um, of the most, some of the two most prestigious institutions, they are horribly wrong. And I don't understand how this is possible and how they can be consistently wrong for 20 years. Uh, this report just came out a few days ago, the World Energy Outlook by the International Energy Agency, uh, which is based in Paris. And they have a very, very uh, linear thinking. And also, the US Department of Energy, they have the EIA, which is the Energy Information Administration. They also have linear thinking. Let me show you what they have been doing for the last 20 years. They have been always wrong terribly wrong, uh, because they just um, do linear forecast and actually flat forecast. If you look at what they were doing in every year, uh, basically, uh, in terms of solar energy, they continuously underestimated it for two decades. You might wonder, how is this possible? How can they make the same mistake for 20 years and no one tells them that they are crazy? Uh, I don't know in Russia how good your uh, solar energy forecasts are, but, but you can see the International Energy Agency, how terribly wrong it is, because solar energy is growing exponentially, very fast exponentially. In fact, you can look in a logarithmic graph over the, uh, the last uh, two, three decades, a continuously uninterrupted exponential growth on a logarithmic scale. And, and this will continue. And that means that in about two decades, all the energy, basically, that we use on planet Earth will be solar-based energy. Forget about oil. Bye-bye, Luke Oil. Bye-bye, Ross uh, Neft. All of those oil companies um, will basically die. Also, um, production is increasing exponentially, and costs are being reduced exponentially, which is also very important. There is an incredibly fast reduction in the cost of all the solar panels. And we have reached, in half of the world, what is called grid parity. Grid parity is the moment when the solar energy is cheaper than the fossil fuel energy. And this is happening in over half of the planet already, and in the next two years, in the whole planet, even in places that don't have a lot of sunshine, solar energy will be cheaper than fossil fuels. Why? Because solar energy is the elephant in the room. If you look at the global consumption of energy, uh, five years ago it was already uh, 15 terawatts of power, but look at the big elephant, it's solar power, and basically it comes every day for free, um, on the planet. So it, this is unstoppable eventually. We will have solar energy throughout the planet. And this is the largest industry in the world. The energy industry is about $8 trillion today. And it is being totally disrupted. There is a complete disruption of the energy sector and the incumbents, the companies that are in the sector, do not see it coming. Um, with a friend of mine from Stanford who wrote Clean Disruption, I wrote the prologue and then I uh, supervised the translation. He basically says, he's a professor of Stanford in Silicon Valley, 
that uh, Silicon Valley will make oil, nuclear, natural gas, coal, electric utilities, and conventional cars obsolete by 2030. This is in 11 years. We are not talking in a century. We are not talking even in 30 years. We are talking in 11 years, the death of the oil industry. Why? Well, the National Academy of Engineering of the USA, uh, led by Larry Page from Google Alphabet, they have decided that the number one problem of humanity from an engineering point of view is to make solar energy economical. My alma mater, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, now tells all the students at MIT they need to learn energy because this is the number one challenge of the planet in the future. Once we solve the energy problem that we will, in two decades, we will solve basically all the other problems which are related to energy. Companies are changing their view of the world, like BP, is no longer British Petroleum, first because it is not British anymore, really, as the major shareholder, and second because it is beyond petroleum. Also Shell companies positioning itself as a post-petroleum company, and they are beginning to see the incredible amount of uh, resources in, in wind, biomass, solar, geothermal, and space-based solar power. Uh, energy has gone through different waves. And each wave is faster, shorter, and cleaner, which is important, cleaner and cleaner. If you look at how it has evolved from uh, trees, good, to coal, very dirty coal, to oil, also dirty, to gas, a little bit less dirty. But now we have energy sources which are cleaner and cleaner. As the Sheikh Ahmed Yamani said in 2000, the stone age did not end because of lack of stones. And the oil age will end soon and not because of lack of oil. And then he was asked, when will this happen? And he said in the year 2030. So basically we agree with him, the oil age will end in 11 years. On top of that, you know, there is the problem of global warming. You might believe it that it is human-made or not human-made. Like, for example, there is indeed an increase of solar activity, which obviously also causes solar uh, warming, uh, climate uh, change. But there is no doubt that there is warming, as you can see, uh, through looking underwear and uh, swimming suits. Uh, there is global warming in the planet. And countries are changing radically. Germany with the energy vendor, the energy transition in Germany, they have been able in the last decade to create a clean uh, energy industry. Now, one third of the energy in Germany is clean. And this was done in 10 years. Other countries, even uh, the United Arab Emirates, they created a city called Masdar City, which will be totally renewable, relying on solar energy, electric transportation, forget about gasoline, forget about petroleum in Abu Dhabi. And uh, even uh, outside the pyramids, you can see it's full of um, solar panels. The energy used today is horribly uh, inefficient. In the USA, which is the largest consumer of energy, now China catching up, you can see that over half of the energy is wasted. Half of the energy is wasted. And actually, the dirtier the energy, like coal, the more is wasted. That is why we need to get rid of this dirty energy. We are moving from the internet uh, into this energy internet of clean energy. Uh, right now, we are at very low levels of energy content. If you see which kind of fuels we use, they are very inefficient yet. We are going to keep on moving up the ladder or going down here in this case, in more and more energy efficient materials. And now the electric cars are coming and these are unstoppable, totally unstoppable because they will be in five years cheaper than any gasoline car. Also Tesla is offering free recharging of electric cars throughout the USA for free forever. It is hard to compete with something that is free. So forget about gasoline, gasoline has no future. Tesla created the largest gigafactory to create all the uh, solar batteries. And uh, what happened after Tesla, Elon Musk announced that this was the largest 
battery factory in the world? The Chinese came in and they said they are going to do many gigafactories bigger than Tesla's factory. This is unstoppable worldwide. If you look at the efficiency and the price reduction of cars, look at, at uh, the famous uh, Model T from Ford, how the price goes down with the increase of production. This is the learning curves of production. The same is happening right now with the Tesla cars, the Model 3 of Tesla. And you can actually put the two together. You can see the Tesla with the Ford, how they follow exactly the same curve. If people think this is impossible, look at New York in 13 years. First. 1900. There were no cars. This was all horses. Horses in New York, 1900. By 1913, it was only cars except for one horse in the same Fifth Avenue. In 13 years, they moved from horses into gasoline cars. Now, we are going to move into electric cars in one decade and a half. We have a lot of uh, energy-based solar power, but we can also get it from the sun. Actually, the satellites use solar energy, the International Space Station, and this is changing how we see the future. One small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Or as uh, Carl Sagan said, we are just a pale blue dot in the universe. We are just a small point in our galaxy. And now we will have planetary internet and Google is connecting everything. You can have Google Earth, you, you have Google Moon, you have Google Mars, you have Google Sky. And we are going to go to Mars in the next decade. Why? Because there are many countries now racing. This is not like the uh, race before between the Soviet Union and the USA. Now we have the USA, Russia, China, European Union, Japan, and India, and we have companies. We have a SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, and many other companies to go to Mars in the next decade. Elon Musk, I think he will do it. He said, in 10 years, we will be on Mars. I participate on many projects, and I just came from the first Mars simulation done in Spain. I want to show you quickly. I was one of the five astronauts that were training for three months to go to Mars. And this is the team, an international team of different nationalities, here with the governor of northern Spain. And uh, this is entering the cave. We did a simulation in a cave because we believe the first humans will live in caves because of radiation. This, this was our base station where we stayed. Uh, you can see uh, videos, there are many videos, but we don't have time. The first Martians will be humans. We will be the first Martians. We will be in, on Mars in 10 years, and we will terraform Mars, and we will find life probably in other places. There is a movement that started here in Russia called Cosmism, Cosmism that be be began as a cultural art trend in the 18th century, became more and more scientific. And there are two incredible uh, Russians, Nikolai Fedorov, more philosophical, and Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, more scientific, one of the first rocket scientists in human history. And he said, the Earth is the cradle of humanity, but we cannot live forever in a cradle. We need to colonize space. We need to take humanity beyond our tiny planet. And this is also what Sir Arthur C. Clarke always said, we need to colonize the universe. But we don't know how the Martians will be. Maybe they will be bad and they will want to kill us or other extraterrestrials. Maybe they will be good, like in Wally. But probably they will be fat. You know, we don't know how they will be. These are some future Martians, maybe. Uh, but evolution continues. We have to do it carefully. We don't want to finish like that. It's better if we finish more um, like a cyborg, a robot in the future to colonize. Humans have existed only 100,000 years in our form today. Only 100,000 years. Actually, for the first 3 billion years, we only had bacteria in the planet. So we need to think how we are going to evolve. And I love talking about Chinese culture because they have yin and yang. And even inside yin yang, they have little yin yang and even more and more little yin yang. So this is very philosophical, very deep. And we have to be careful about the dark side of the force. But the Chinese say, let's light up the world. Do not blame darkness illuminate the world. And we have to do it carefully because if you look at Korea, a country that I love, uh, there are two Koreas. There is South Korea illuminated, 
example of development, and North Korea, a total disaster leaving two centuries behind. So we have to meditate about the future. I love meditations, Hindu, Buddhist, any meditation. And I want to finish with this beautiful Chinese word that the Japanese and the Koreans and the Vietnamese, when they use Chinese characters, understand. This is the Chinese word that means crisis. Crisis in Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese has two characters. The, the first character means danger, but the second character means opportunity. Humanity is living the most incredible time. We will become a transplanetary civilization. And tomorrow, I'll talk about immortality if you want to come. You have the information there. Tomorrow at 8 o'clock, I will tell you the secrets of immortality. Thank you very much. Es pasivo. Okay, thank you very much for interesting talk. Um, I will correct a question and a comment later after all presentation finished. Okay, so let's move to the next speaker, uh, Pavel. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pavel Bakhtin. I'm the head of the Data Analysis unit, uh, unit in Institute for Statistical Studies and Economics of Knowledge, HSC. Uh, we have prepared this presentation together with uh, the director of Center for Strategic Analysis and Big Data, Ilya Guzminov. And I'm going to uh, talk about forecasting of research fronts uh, and give a case study in the area of artificial intelligence based on semantic analysis. Thank you, no problem. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk uh, what is the research question with, uh, with the identification of research fronts, why do we need it? Then I'll talk about uh, traditional approaches to uh, identification of research fronts. Then uh, we'll talk about the problems of this approach and present alternatives in the form of semantic analysis. Uh, compare different models and conclude with the case study. So the research question, uh, we have a lot of data now, scientific articles, patents, uh, media, uh, news, uh, analytical reports, books, conference materials, grant awards descriptions. So all this data has to be processed and we have to um, find and understand what our researchers and inventors are doing, what are the major topics uh, they deal with, what are the technologies they develop, and what is emerging now based on this big data. So we um, have to take all this data and uh, identify the research fronts uh, based on this data. So what is a traditional approach that was uh, introduced in um, Web of Science, um, a database by Thomson Reuters, now by Clarative Analytics. Uh, it is the use of uh, citations and co-citation indicator when uh, they basically take uh, the most cited research publications in different areas and they uh, evaluate how these documents are connected to each other in terms of co-citations. So then they turn it into a, a graph, do some network analysis, and uh, cluster the, docu the documents into research fronts. In the end, we have a list of uh, documents that describe one topic or another. So this approach is uh, pretty good. It uh, really allows us to divide uh, you know, science and then technology into different uh, directions and find different trends in the data. But the problem with that is that uh, it focuses on retrospective data. So uh, citations, they don't uh, appear in one day. We have to wait for this data to slowly aggregate uh, in some database and then we can calculate these citations and over the years we can form these uh, research fronts. So first of all is the, the, the focus on res retrospective data really slows us down. Second, it's a citation lag. So uh, more or less the same point. Um, that we have to wait for this data. The third one, uh, third point, uh, the problem of this traditional approach is the complexity of calculations. Uh, imagine how many citations is being done by researchers every day. 
Every paper usually cites from 30 to 100 or even more other, other uh, research papers. And all this accumulates into billions and trillions of uh, uh, edges uh, in the graph. And it becomes very hard to calculate this, to actually cluster this data and come up with any conclusions. Then, uh, we all know about the referencing bias. So when the citations are done, it's not uh, always uh, kind of, it doesn't always have the same value. Sometimes we cite someone that really inspired our work. Sometimes we cite someone just because they also thought about this problem, but the citation is not equal. In this approach, it's very hard to distinguish between kind of significant citations and just normal citations. And uh, of course, that's, that leads us to lack of citation context. We don't understand what was the reason for citation. It's very hard to do that with that approach. So what is the alternative approach? Uh, alternative approach is not to wait for citations to be formed, not to wait for retrospective data to be built, but to rather work with uh, text and the meaning of the text, the semantics. Uh, in this case, uh, abstracts of papers are available for each, uh, for each paper. The abstract gives the main idea of each um, research. It tells about what is proposed in the paper, what are the main conclusions. So by uh, actually um, processing the abstract of text, we really can get an idea of what is going on. And if we compare these abstracts of text between each other, we can understand how they are, how connected they are. And uh, if we cluster this abstract text, we can actually come up with, with topics. So some similar, similar ideas that researchers are developing. So what is the, basically the metric to understand that uh, the documents are similar? Uh, in our case, in our system in ESEC, IFORA, we use a cosine similarity between documents that helps us to uh, basically estimate uh, the, the similarity between two documents. But what do we calculate? Because at first, you only have text. How do you go from text to numbers that can be compared? So on this slide, uh, I'm giving you an evolution of vector models, which main task is to transform the text into a numeric vector. So these approaches have existed for a very long time and started with very simple approaches like bag of words, where we would just uh, put all our words that were in the text and give zeros uh, to, the, to the words that didn't exist in our document and ones to the documents that existed. Then we started to become more, uh, we started to use more complicated approaches, use a term frequency, inverse document frequency, uh, matrix that would calculate the frequency of each word in the document and specificity of this word in order to discriminate uh, general words and to give a boost to some specific words so that they come up uh, higher in the rankings. Then appeared probabilistic topic models and started and really changed the the industry of uh, this uh, semantic analysis, they gave a big boost, but it still was not enough uh, to understand and to encode the semantics be behind every document. So 2013, 2014, we had a first revolution in natural language processing and word embeddings appeared. So we, most of us have heard about word to vec glove, these are two uh, examples of these neural network approaches, neural network technologies that started to encode uh, every word there is in the language into a numerical vector so that the words that are similar in context would have similar coordinates in the vector space. So if, for example, cat and dog are something that are similar to each other, there are pets, we play with them, we feed them, 
they do different things. So in general, they're used in the similar context. So we now have a vector space. Cat and dog would also have a similar vectors. So now we understand using the numerical uh, uh, numerical form, numerical vectors, we now can really turn the text into the meaning. Finally, the last revolution of 2017, 2018, and 2019 happening right now is the appearance of uh, deep neural networks uh, with transformer architecture. Uh, you might have heard about some of them, like BERT, uh, GPT-2, ERNI-2, Roberta, XLNet, these are the new semantic models that don't just encode terms into numerical vectors, but they also understand the context uh, uh, in which uh, a particular word was used. So that helps us to deal with different problems like polysemy and uh, others. So they really are advanced and can uh, help us to understand what was the direct meaning of these particular documents so that we can then compare them. So if we want to somehow replace the co-citation analysis and to use semantics, for forming of research fronts, we have to assess our models somehow. We have to understand that these models are actually working. So in our research, we took uh, 348 research fronts from Web of Science, that is 10,219 uh, research papers. And we, divide, we randomly divided uh, all these uh, documents in two, in two sets. One was training sample, and one was test sample. And we use various semantic models that exist uh, nowadays to encode the meaning of each uh, research paper, of each research paper's abstract text into a numerical vector to then compare it to each other. So what we did was uh, we told our models that uh, half of the data is already assigned to different research fronts. Can these models actually predict the other half of our documents? Can they predict uh, and uh, turn these papers into right research fronts? Can we really do that? So we tested this uh, idea and you see uh, a, a typical uh, measurements of this classification uh, efficiency problem uh, as precision recall and F1 score with the last one being a harmonic mean of precision and recall. Basically the F1 score uh, tells us how good our model is. And we can see that most models performed rather well. Uh, so they gave uh, 72, uh, 0 0.72, 0 0.78. But as we go further with the evolution of the models and as we look at the best performing models that appeared only in 2018, 2019, we see uh, a big increase in numbers. We see that efficiency is almost 88%. That means that we almost predicted, uh, this co-citation was almost predicted with just semantics, without any knowledge about the citation network, citations between documents. So that uh, gives us uh, a new ability, uh, gives us a new way, a new instrument to actually calculate the research fronts. So here on this slide, I have given um, an example of the best performing model, uh, it's called uh, Cybeard, uh, built on the uh, Beard architecture. This model is uh, actually available in open source, so uh, I have put some links that can help to play with these models. Uh, the, one of the strong sides of this model is actually uh, the ability to fine tune it for a specific task that you have. And in our case, because we wanted to compare the meaning 
of documents between each other, we fine-tuned it on a special STSB benchmark, uh, which uh, basically presents a number of sentences with uh, and estimates how similar these sentences are to each other. So by fine-tuning uh, this model on these sentences, we really increased uh, its uh, efficiency. And as you see, uh, the last uh, row here, Cybert STB fine-tuned, it shows uh, thank you, uh, shows 88 efficiency compared to 75 efficiency without fine tuning. So the fine tuning on this Cosine similarity task, it actually works. Then we uh, uh, chose a pooling strategy of the CLS token. Uh, you can uh, I, I won't explain too much about it at the moment. This is just uh, an approximation of the numerical vector of, of the document on, and of each sentence uh, so that we come up with the basically document encoding, semantic encoding. We used uh, the last pooling layer because uh, this neural network, it has 12 uh, layers and we used the last one because it's most representative. Uh, we use the PyTorch um, uh, framework to do the fine tuning. And finally, for industrial implementation of the vector model to make it work um, faster than it works in original uh, frameworks, we used Spacey Transformer um, repository. So I really advise to have a look at this if you want to try something like that, because uh, this uh, all the, uh, the Spacey Transformer covers all uh, new transformer architectural neural networks and allows to play with them um, in the open in the open source with open source libraries. So this is free. So finally, we go to the case study. Um, as you can see, we uh, took this uh, best performing Cybert fine tuned model. We took uh, about 180,000 research papers uh, in the area of uh, artificial intelligence uh, from Web of Science, uh, available for the last, uh, that, was pub that were published for the last five years. We encoded all the abstracts of these scientific articles, so we had the meaning of each paper, and then we just used these embeddings, these vect numerical vectors, to cluster them and to see what are the main topics uh, exist in the area of artificial intelligence in, in, the, uh, in the research papers. Uh, so that would be our research fronts uh, based on semantic analysis. And as you can see, uh, one of the biggest cluster there is uh, in terms of the amount of documents is actually natural language processing, with, which is not a big surprise. So things like named entity recognition, uh, information extraction, text classification, sentiment analysis is what like, uh, most of researchers in AI are focused on. We can see uh, applications to manufacturing and industry uh, 4.0, so intelligent manufacturing systems, smart manufacturing, um, and the use of tools like process mining to analyze business processes in them. And there are many more topics which you can see now on the slide. This is based on the amount of documents, but what if, what if we want to see what is really emerging right now? What if we want to forecast what is going to happen in the nearest future? Uh, we uh, calculate the trending index uh, as a kind of mean year uh, of these papers uh, published uh, for uh, a particular topic. So if this mean year is, is moved closer to 2019, we understand that this is some kind of a new emerging topic and we give this trending index of one and close to one. So uh, we have ordered our topics in terms of this trending index and we can see which topics at the moment in the AI are having the biggest attention of researchers uh, as of basically 2019, 2018. And we can see, for example, that one of the first topics is 
uh, electronic skin, self-powering, flexible electronics, biochips, wearable electronics. So application of AI in this area seems to be, uh, seems to attract the most focus of researchers. Same happens with, for example, quantum computing, as you see the second one. This has existed for a long time, but we see that application of AI in quantum computing is kind of has the biggest effect right now in 2018, 2019, it's really growing. So more or less this uh, concludes uh, the research uh, fronts uh, identification using semantic analysis. What we can say as a final kind of note, we see based on this benchmark that I presented uh, on uh, research fronts that the embedding models, semantic vector models, have reached the state of the development that allows them to understand the meaning of each document. We can really uh, now use this to compare the documents, to cluster them, and to find topics hidden in them. Co-citation analysis is still a good instrument, but it relies on lagging data. That means that we have to combine these two approaches to uh, analyze retrospective data with co-citation and to analyze new emerging data on research fronts using semantic analysis. Um, and finally, um, the use of Cybert as the best performing model at the moment uh, for the research papers helps us to forecast new research fronts before any citation is calculated. So here I'm wrapping up my um, presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer to the question after we have time for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let's move to the sala. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah, Sarah Cha from Singapore, National University of Singapore. So I'm going to share with you um, learning in digital economy and uh, maybe give you some background about this project. Uh, this project was commissioned by a, a company um, to look at educational technology development for the next 10 years uh, with a view to uh, investing in it and uh, also looking at venture nurturing. So commissioned uh, by this uh, organization, so we adopted um, the foresight methodology, uh, actually the initial phases of foresight methodology which uh, pertains to intelligence uh, for them. So, and, uh, so the methodology here is uh, just using horizon scanning, uh, literature review, um, secondary research on um, uh, the technology trends, market trends, uh, with a view to uh, advising the company on where the uh, opportunities are uh, for long-term planning and long-term investment. So an overview of uh, educational technology um, development. The reason that I, I being an academic, uh, am interested in uh, developing uh, participating and leading this project was because uh, NUS, the National University of Singapore itself, is also looking at educational technologies. And um, I don't know about your university, but uh, our universities have not been uh, very um, advanced when it comes to adopting educational technology. So a lot of the, uh, you know, activities we conducted in the classroom are still very traditional. Uh, we still use uh, I mean, lecture slides, uh, uh, materials that are, um, you know, still rather offline and we don't really have an integrated system to do adaptive learning for the learners, right? So, so this project actually was a, a, also a good um, a resource. Uh, the findings was, were a good resource for us as uh, universities uh, to see how we can be uh, preparing uh, our ourselves as an organization as well as the new generation in terms of learning. So the uh, an overview of the educational technology uh, 
uh, industry here is that uh, now globally it is a huge market, $250 billion by 2020, growing at a CAGR compound annual rate growth rate of 17%. Now, whereas um, uh, of this component, Asia itself made up uh, 46, uh, 42% and is uh, growing at a much faster rate uh, than the rest of the world. Now, you can see from this slide here that uh, while uh, you know, what, what is uh, demonstrated, indicated in blue color here uh, as the, the percentage proportion by the U.S. market, uh, it is uh, the majority. It occupies 60% in 2011. Uh, however, um, you know, you can see also that the, the gray portion, which is Asia Pacific, is growing at a much faster rate and has grown from 14% uh, to 19%, and the absolute figure also has grown. Now, exactly what type of um, educational technologies, um, you know, are really gathering momentum uh, in the recent years and are, con are likely to continue to take us through? We have uh, gone through various sources of data, um, and uh, we can see from this slide here that um, the key uh, technologies uh, that are of interest uh, are uh, learning management system, uh, adaptive learning, Language learning, especially uh, you know, in this time and age where a lot of um, uh, uh, trade and transactions are being conducted uh, in a cross-border fashion, where companies, uh, even startups, are no longer just uh, you know, serving local market, but they have to be born global from the start. And so this uh, ability to be able to, to handle multiple languages, foreign languages, uh, has also helped to drive uh, educational technologies. And then we also see online to offline, or we call it O2O, uh, uh, learning uh, uh, technology, and so on. So with this um, uh, different, or rather with this overall trend uh, in the, at a global level, we then shift our focus onto Asian market, because we believe that there's still a lot of um, uh, a lot of growth potential uh, that can be uh, harnessed in Asia. So what exactly are the key drivers here? So when we did our horizon scanning uh, for key drivers in uh, Asia market, at tech for short. Um, so we look at the technologies. Now the strategic technologies here refer to key technologies um, that drive ad tech adoption by the various mainstream markets. So we also look at the hype cycle, and uh, we, apart from technology, we look at economic and business drivers. Economic drivers also refer to government policies that are supportive of um, education uh, and uh, ad tech adoption. And for business drivers, they look at what are the factors that actually drive corporations, organizations, institutions, suppliers, and distributors to move into this space for adoption. Now, social cultural uh, development drivers refer to the, uh, the factors that will you know, facilitate internet um, penetration rates and um, also capture the demographic changes. So if you look at the technology driver, uh, we have segmented into K, K to 12. K to 12 means kindergarten to year 12 um, uh, level of education. Now for this um, uh, kindergarten to, to uh to level 12, uh, the key technologies identified from various sources, uh, including the hype cycle, shows that uh, artificial intelligence, uh, augmented reality, AR, and virtual reality, VR, uh, digital assessment, adaptive learning, all these are actually something that's going to happen or already happening in two to five years' time. Whereas um, there is also a uh, uh, this need for... Uh, digital ecosystem, which is an integration of uh, or development of an ecosystem uh, that allow uh, different uh, systems to cooperate or interoperate seamlessly together. And this uh, is uh, also a strategic technology that is envisioned to uh, be important uh, within the next 10 years. So apart from K to 12 education, we also look at higher education. Now, for higher education, uh, we actually see additional technologies. Now, what are the additional five technologies here? Refer to robotic telepresence. Now, what that means is that um, in the future, uh, in the universities, we may not need to have lecturers being present. Uh, the lecturers can be represented by either a chatbot or a physical robot um, and uh, to be delivering the lecture. Uh, that's, um, uh, so that, that kind of telepresence and uh, predictive analytics 
and uh, hybrid integration platforms, as well as listening and sensing technology. Now, why that is important? With, because um, uh, when people learn, they want to be very immersive uh, you know, in, their, in their learning experience. They want to be able to simulate uh, the environment um, you know, for instance, if a pilot is, or a trainee pilot is learning how to operate a plane, they will want to move into an environment that can simulate a plane. Uh, um, so with that sensing and the movement, uh, it can give them uh, some real uh, kind of, a, or rather a simulated kind of experience. And then we also have institutional uh, and video management. So uh, after looking at technology drivers, we then uh, look at economic drivers. Now, economic drivers, um, we see that um, public sector expenditure on uh, um, education uh, as a percentage of GDP uh, actually has been quite flat across the countries. Right? As you can see here, um, I think most governments have really done what they can uh, in spending on, organization, uh, on education. Um, and then when it comes to um, the priority, uh, or rather the ranking, uh, the spending on e-learning itself, which is um, a digitized form of education, it's interesting here that uh, this, if you look at this whole uh, market, which shows a, a four trillion uh, market, global market size of uh, education, is 4.4 trillion as at 2012. 2015, just within uh, three years, is supposed to have uh, increased to 5.5 trillion. However, if you look at um, the red box here, that uh, actually boxes up e-learning, which captures educational technology, uh, digital, digital form of, tech, of learning, uh, is only 3%, a very small percentage, uh, meaning that um, uh, the, the educational technology market has only captured a very small fraction of the education market, right? So there's still a lot more uh, opportunity for growth. And then if you look at this education market, uh, the, uh, a lot of the revenue, key revenue drivers, key revenue sources are from tuition as well as program management. And the gross profits in these areas can actually, uh, uh, you know, very high. They can range from 60 to 90 percent. And net profit uh, from anything from 2 to 10 percent. Okay. So next, we shift uh, our lens to business drivers. So what are really motivating companies, institutions, organizations to want to adopt educational technology? So we see that there are top 10 reasons for that. And one of them is the, the desire, the need to provide competency-based education. That means uh, instead of just learning traditional uh, subjects like science, math, and uh, technology, which is very important, but uh, it also requires the education to be very focused on competencies and skills, reinventing credentials, uh, analytics, and also the motivation to secure good ranking among the universities will push them to want to adopt educational technologies, revenue diversification, political intervention, innovative learning space, you know, personalization, student recruiting, all these are uh, key business trends, business drivers. Now, if you, uh, what we did next was that we match um, business drivers together with technology drivers, and um, together we see what are the key, um, you know, technologies that has a matching of both the technology push and the market pool. And we can see that the cloud, the mobile social computing, um, Internet of Things, all these are uh, 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 critical components of the educational technologies that are emerging, right? So, from the social cultural development, which is a very important aspect, we also see a rise of the middle class, right, in Asia especially, because uh, as where, where there is rising affluence, there's also the aspirations of the parents to want their children to attain a higher standard of living, and uh, but and, and they see the education, especially tertiary education, as the roots for social mobility, upward social mobility. And China and India alone, they have been un, they have an unmet demand for tertiary education of 30 million youths, right, in each of these countries. And then the growth of e-learning, even though uh, there is a general decline in e-learning uh, revenue globally, but we see that in Asia it is. Um, uh, still experiencing a double-digit growth. Now, uh, it's also interesting to note that uh, some countries have not gone into internet. Instead, they leapfrog the internet uh, development and went straight into mobile 
uh, penetration. Now, these mobile uh, first countries, uh, that means they adopt a technology using mobile phone rather than computer, rather than the traditional notebook or desktop, actually are also the first one to adopt uh, learning on mobile platform. And we call it mobile learning, M learning for short, as opposed to e learning. Okay, so e learning, mobile learning, gamification, simulation learning are some promising educational technology services uh, segments. Now, this chart shows an a in interesting phenomenon. It shows the girls uh, enrollment ratio for um, tertiary education between 2000 to 2015. You notice that there is this very high, uh, high solid line uh, that, that, uh, that is hovering around 90% uh, or even exceeding, uh, so much more than the other countries like uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore, and so on, right? So this is Korea. Korea, um, because of their uh, policy decision, uh, for the past 10 years, uh, or at least over the last 10 years, uh, they have encouraged a, a lot of um, uh, um, their youths uh, to go for tertiary education and also make available tertiary education uh, easily. So, so much so that uh, universities can be set up relatively easily, that uh, among professors, a few professors, they, can, they are free to propose causes. And, and uh, that in itself, while well, it's good, because it did satisfy the demand for tertiary education, but that created another problem. Now, what is the problem here is that there just were not enough jobs uh, for graduates, right, in Korea. And uh, so, because of this phenomenon, or rather this mismatch of expectations, their graduates find that they have a lot to work, work a lot harder than the previous generation, who also got a tertiary education, but they seem to be able to secure jobs relatively easily, right? So, so with that, uh, we see a, a huge tension between the senior workers and the younger workers. Um, where the younger workers feel that they have, the younger graduates feel that they have been denied the opportunity despite having uh, achieved tertiary education. So, um, right. And the other uh, social cultural uh, development also shows that uh, there is um, a very high um, level of um, uh, youthful users, um, or rather youth, you know, for uh, internet uh, penetration, for connectivity. So the youthfulness of the online audiences are very apparent in countries like China and India, as mentioned earlier, so making M learning a lot more uh, attractive and compelling. So, so here are some slides on e-learning revenue uh, that are uh, being dominated by uh, US, North America, uh, but the learning growth itself uh, driven primar primarily by Asia. And um, in we, social cultural development also shows that serious gaming is a very important trend based learning versus simulation based learning and the rise of uh, mobile connectivity mobile learning and then um, how are we doing on time okay I think just in summary I would say that uh, the challenges here uh, okay, let me just find a slide yep the opportunities and challenges uh, in summary I would just say that uh, you know it's very very attractive for for India and China and uh, the, the key opportunities lie in M learning, in language learning, in O2O, and as well as uh, MOOC, which stands for Mass Online Courses, right? And in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, there are also countries like Vietnam that is growing at a phenomenal rate, like 40%, um, outstripping everyone, and then followed by uh, other countries like Indonesia, Thailand, and so on. Okay, so that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much for oh, interesting talk. Okay, so last speaker of this session is uh, okay. Добрый день, уважаемые дамы и господа. С вашего позволения, я сделаю презентацию на русском, хотя слайды будут на английском. Вначале несколько слов, что такое национальный исследовательский центр имени Жуковского. Это такое образование в Российской Федерации введенное отдельным законом, если говорить об аналогах, мы очень похожи на НАСА в Америке, в ДЛР в Европе или в ДЖАКСА в Японии. У нас работает 12,5 тысяч ученых, большой очень оборот, мы занимаемся всем, чего летает в Российской Федерации и за рубежом. 
Соответственно, занимаемся прогнозной деятельностью, и я очень благодарен Высшей школе экономики за приглашение выступить здесь на очень уважаемой конференции. При этом нас интересуют достаточно такие уже из сугубо целевых или унитарных вопросов форсайта, уже некие теоретические аспекты, которые мы отслеживаем. И вот я постараюсь их представить вашему вниманию, потому что у нас достаточно много совместных работ с Высшей школой экономики, еще раз хочу сказать. И нам важно не только их проговаривать, но и афишировать, и, возможно, искать какие-то новые пути в решениях задач в прогнозах. Первое, с чего хотел я начать, это с названия нашей сессии. Называется отраслевые, «Отраслевые исследования». «Форсайт. Отраслевые исследования». Начал я с того, что вот, мне очень не нравится слово «отрасль». Ну, причем даже считаю его достаточно вредным. Вот я вижу некие исследования и слово «отрасль». Это, в общем... Считаю, что уже сразу же что-то не получилось. Почему? Потому что э, отраслевых показателей – это, в принципе, политические показатели для лидеров многих государств или там, правительств, которые агрегируют, э, допустим, социальную политику в той или иной, э, на той или иной территории, либо вот по каким-то сегментам. Почему? Почему мне это не нравится с точки зрения техники и науки? Потому что определить контур отрасли невозможно. Вот в Российской Федерации, если предприятие выпустило вот такой стаканчик и сделало техническое условие использования его в авиации, оно уже относится к авиационной отрасли. Другого критерия нет. То есть к авиационной отрасли, любой другой отрасли, как бы в статистике, может отнести любое предприятие. Если у нас контура управления нет, четкого контура управления, значит управлять этим невозможно. Значит, соответственно, скажем, это э, степень допущения и, допустим, при анализе э, научно-технологических фронтов либо с, любой, любой статистики, она может быть любая. То есть статистика, она такая, в общем, наука, ну, э, скажем, что заложишь, что и получишь, так вот закладывать можно все, что угодно. Э, поэтому мне больше нравятся виды техники. Почему? Потому что если уже итог не отрасли, а вид техники и количество выпускаемой продукции, тогда уже этот контур управления очерчен, и, соответственно, можно получить хоть какие-то реальные показатели. Это первое. Второе, то, что, в общем, как раз мы занимаемся авиацией. Я бы вот начал бы с этого слайда. Анализ показал, что на сегодняшний день вот, всех исследований очень интересен в авиации. Это такой драйвер, мировой драйвер экономики, где передовые технологии используются впервые. Многие технологии использовались впервые. И вообще, в принципе, поиск технологий он развит больше, чем в других. Ну, наверное, только впереди там космонавты еще находятся. Но здесь вот мы на втором месте. Так вот, приводя такой пример, что в 1953 году, в 1953 году уже был полностью описан математический реактивный двигатель, к сегодняшнему моменту мы пришли к тому, что все страны мира отказались проектировать новый самолет. Значит, все, что сейчас делается, это, по сути дела, ну, скажем так, в том виде модернизации существующей техники, существующих подходов. Почему? А потому что закончился вот этот цикл технологического роста, и на сегодняшний день, по сути дела, мы пришли вот в этой S-образной прямой к максимуму в достижениях тех технологий, которые вот за последние, там, сколько получается, там 70-80 лет придумывались и использовались. Очень интересный слом, такой трендовый слом вообще в технологиях. Поэтому он такой требует еще, наверное, и достаточно серьезного теоретического осмысления, осмысления, но при этом он должен показать, в том числе, как, допустим, на таком сломе экономики могут развиваться. При этом это интересный тренд, это не только мы подметили, вот у нас очень такие тесные взаимосвязи и вот с Америкой, и с Европой, и с Японией, вот то, что я сказал, 
Это мы достаточно часто обсуждаем, у всех приблизительно такие же подходы, и это, в общем, такое консолидированное мнение вообще в мировой, мировой авиационной тусовке, если так можно сказать. Но следующее, следующее что бы хотелось бы сказать, что при таком, скажем, глубоком форсайте, который мы делаем, то важно понимать, а вот где зарабатываются деньги. Вот э, если мы... Э, очень важен этот э, тезис, потому что очень многие увлеклись технологиями, э, но э, смысл в том, что э, все деньги, они зарабатываются, зарабатываются на серийном производстве. Причем даже так, что если даже если стартап что-то развил, в любом случае стартап продается, потом капитализируется и продается компании с большим серийным производством, которые имеют деньги, потом их отбить на серийном производстве. В любом случае все заканчивается серийным производством. А при этом важно понимать и анализировать вот жизненный цикл, как мы понимаем, потому что вот разработка, дизайн, подготовка производства, это все идет в минус. И, соответственно, скажем, только потом, когда выходишь на серию, что-то получаешь в качестве, в качестве прибыли. И поэтому вся совокупность этих факторов, она отражает на анализ и, прежде всего, вывод о перспективности тех или иных технологий. И это имеет достаточно большой социально-экономический эффект, о котором я немножко расскажу позже. Возвращаясь к, опять к жизненному циклу, в разных странах разные, и в разных компаниях абсолютно разные подходы. Вот здесь мы привели две схемы, такое понимание жизненного цикла, как вот текущую модель или конструкторскую модель, инновационную модель. Она такая вот, это все-таки вещь, на кое-где она закреплена, законодательство в странах, где-то есть это вкусовщина, где-то все зависит от лидера той или иной компании. Но опять, кто, кто как принимает решение? Принимает решение либо... Ты сразу принимаешь решение, ты понимаешь продукты, под него выстраиваешь компанию, либо, либо, соответственно, производство, либо ты долго ищешь технологии, которые нужны тебе для того, чтобы выйти, выйти на рынок. Принципиальная разница, принципиальная разница во времени. Почему я об этом говорю? Факт открытия фундаментального исследования, какой-то факт, он становится максимально известен достаточно быстро. Все ученые это публикуют, а дальше начинается гонка для того, чтобы научиться управлять этим эффектом, который фундаментальный ученый открыл. Так вот, это процесс сугубо времени. Он от, не зависит, в принципе, скажем, от каких-то таких... Ну, так скажем, он абсолютно просчитываемый, абсолютно математически просчитываемый, и ä, понятно, в принципе, когда ä, можно получить эффект от ä, данной технологии. Существуют разного рода подходы, вот здесь они приведены, вот это первая шесть, это так называемый уровень готовности технологии, вы с этим складывались, но самое главное к ним относиться не с точки зрения понимания технологии, а с точки зрения управления рисками. И на сегодняшний день вот вся эта схема управления рисками, которая показана на слайде, это приблизительно вот 9-10 лет. То есть вот на сегодняшний день, говоря о всяких прогнозах, вот здесь коллега в первом докладе говорил о изменяющемся мире, о сроках, вот, конечно, мало кто говорит о цифрах, когда что будет меняться, но мы можем четко сказать на сегодняшний день из опыта наших исследований, при появлении фундаментального открытия через 10 лет это будет внедрено. А раньше вряд ли. Вот раньше вряд ли. То есть вот 10 лет мы с вами получили с точки зрения управления рисками и, соответственно, скажем, внедрения технологии в жизнь. Но... Вот специально такой слайд, а что тянет назад? И почему, скажем, много что не получается? Вот вроде кто-то пытается организовать стартапы, даже получает под это дело деньги, гранты, 
А вроде вот э, я уже рассказал о том, что авиация на сегодняшний день, э, по сути дела, не развивается в том виде, в котором она развивалась хотя бы 20-30 лет назад или раньше. А вот э, в чем этот вопрос? Вот э, наши последние исследования, они привели к следующему как показателю. Э, то есть мы такое даже слово придумали, обратный форсайт. Э, что это такое? Э, то есть э, подразумевая тот факт, что деньги зарабатываются на серии, если у тебя есть технологии, значит, ты их должен внедрять. Если ты должен внедрять, ты должен, ты должен поменять квалификацию штата, ты можешь изменить производственные мощности, ты должен поменять кучу разных логистик, и у тебя на это уходит все время. Поэтому вот на сегодняшний день, если у тебя все эти вопросы решены, ты можешь сразу стартовать, а если нет, то, соответственно, скажем, ты уходишь назад по времени и по стоимости для решения этих проблем. И помимо 10 лет, 10 лет перехода из фундаментального, фундаментального исследования, результатов фундаментального исследования к окровским, окровским работам, ты еще теряешь над этим. И это на сегодняшний день гигантская проблема. Просто гигантская проблема. Вот э, здесь много уже, наверное, говорили. Я вообще видел на предыдущих слайдах о э, Тесла. Сказали, Тесла хороший автомобиль, все нормально. Вроде работает. Вроде хорошо ездит. Вот возникает вопрос, а куда девать обычные двигательные заводы, которых на многих странах мира огромное количество. Вот еще этого никто не придумал. Поэтому, по сути дела, гибридный двигатель, который сейчас, вот, допустим, полностью используется, да, вот последняя выставка автомобильная с гибридными двигателями, это, по сути дела, компромисс между новой технологией и старой, чтобы, допустим, не было того социального эффекта, допустим, там, в Германии закрыть все, или там, в Штатах закрыть все э, двигательные заводы, которые, которые есть. Спасибо. Вот, поэтому... В авиации то же самое, вот мы столкнулись в Российской Федерации из-за того, что у нас 14 авиационных заводов, а приблизительно столько же, сколько в остальном, оставшихся, ну, скажем, в остальном мире. То есть достаточно много. Поэтому недозагрузка достаточно большая есть по некоторым предприятиям, а вот, допустим, их закрытие или переход на какой-то новый, такой инновационный, с новыми технологиями вид техники не позволяет просто то, что закрыть этот завод, при том, что там работает от 7 до 10 тысяч народов, практически невозможно. Просто невозможно сразу в реальном, в реальном, в реальном режиме времени. Поэтому в связи с тем, что мы все прекрасно понимаем, что существует закон международного разделения труда, понятно, что вот просто так разработать и выдать денег достаточно много на стартапы, на технологии в стране, то не факт, что серийное производство будет развиваться в этой стране. Она уйдет в другие, совершенно понятно. И, соответственно, скажем, возникает тогда вопрос, а в принципе все это тогда зачем? Зачем такое госфинансирование? Зачем такое вложение и частного бизнеса, который ориентирован именно, прежде всего, на такого локального производителя? И поэтому вот этот слайд, он такой, скажем, может быть и спорный, но мы считаем, что вот чтобы сделать, допустим, полностью допустим, форс... такой глобальный форсайт, как делает Высшая школа экономики по научным фронтам, однозначно нужно говорить и делать форсайт о тех экономических условиях, то есть обратный форсайт, как развивалась экономика, к чему она пришла в той или иной стране, с тем, чтобы четко понимать, а где это можно вообще локализовать, куда этот весь научный фронт должен быть направлен. Следующая тема, то же самое, мы вышли к параллельному форсайту. Но это на самом деле такая глобальная штука. Значит, что произошло? Произошло в том, что на сегодняшний день товар, допустим, в виде самолета, он перестал существовать как товар, стал существовать авиатранс... товар как авиатранспортная система. А авиатранспортная система, почему? Потому что система безопасности, которая диктует ИКАО, она выработала уже общие, признаки, общие принципы безопасности ко всей системе, не только к определенному виду техники, что важно для всей инновационного продукта, как самолет к новым технологиям. Поэтому 
Допустим, скажем, если ты делаешь форсайт в рамках одного вида техники, однозначно нужно делать форсайт в той, в той системе, в которой он функционирует. Иначе тоже опять это не работает, ты не попадаешь по времени. И последнее такое, скажем так, наблюдение, это такой многодисциплинарный форсайт. Ну, сейчас все говорят об электричестве, давайте я тоже в авиации скажу несколько слов про электричество. Сейчас, да, все разрабатывают. Но получается так, вот старта этих технологий, которые где-то стартовали года 3-4 назад до самолета, в принципе, все планируют там 30-й год. Что-то должно полететь. Но а, а, ждать 15-20 лет смысла нет. Ну, то есть, грубо говоря, ни один такой нормальный финансист, либо бюджет это не потянет. А, поэтому а, ведь существует тоже такое экономическое понятие, мультипликативный эффект на влияние тех или иных технологий на экономику. Так важно понимать, что, допустим, в авиации, в космонавтике это коэффициент 10, в авиации 8. То есть что это такое? То есть требования к технологии я максимальные. То есть они где-то есть меньше. Тогда есть меньше, тогда должны быть промежуточные этапы. То есть технологии задаются как максимально, максимальные, разрабатываются как максимальные, а по дороге, ну, за, за ну, на ближайшую перспективу используются в других видах техники, которые не, не являются такими требовательными. И это достаточно такая серьезная, серьезная тема, которая... Но на сегодняшний день абсолютно, скажем так, не рассматривалось. Вот мы не сталкивались с этим делом, потому что каждый пытается как бы там, ну, не показывать, что он делает. Но с другой стороны, достаточно, чем дальше финансирование, тем более серьезные условия у банков на вот, вот такие, такие вещи. А их можно значительно снизить, если использовать много вида технологий и их анализировать с точки зрения но много дисциплинарного применения. Поэтому еще раз вот в заключение хотел сказать о том, что вот на сегодняшний день в связи вот с таким сложностью, скажем так, в развитии мира, мы вроде говорим о многих направлениях, которые развиваются, но мне так кажется, что вот при такой разработке вот у нас появляется все больше и больше ограничений, которые хотелось, чтобы вот на площадке Высшей школы экономики это обсуждалось, потому что это такие те, чисто теоретические вещи, и, может быть, и данная конференция подскажет, а как их обходить или что, что с этим делать и как, как их анализировать. Спасибо за внимание. Uh, please identify yourself, then uh, give us a, a question or comment. Okay, please. Hi, a question to Jose, uh, and I think uh, to maybe others about um, what we uh, call uh, path dependency, uh, uh, sunk assets, uh, etc. So I'm all in favor of the solar renewable revolution. However, I read today in the news that China has uh, great uh, plans and uh, great foresight activity, but in the last year they have opened 43.5 gigawatts of coal-fired power stations. This is about the energy supply of the UK. Uh, and that is one case. I myself have worked in, in the Gulf on low-carbon Qatar, And yes, everybody thinks it's a nice idea, but energy is not only energy, it is money and power. And these things are sometimes harder to transform than the, few, the, the, the physical energy and, and the systems. So um, what can we learn from our last speaker, maybe, in terms of achieving this uh, energy transition? Uh, can we do a reverse foresight? to say, okay, if we are talking not only about energy as a physical uh, material, um, but uh, money and power, which are now deep into the global system, then what can we learn? And uh, well, also I'll just say, my friend has done a book uh, called uh, The Burning Question. And this uh, observes that, yes, if the oil and gas and coal stays in the ground, then we burn. If the oil and gas, sorry, if it comes out of the ground <laughs> and burns, then we all burn. Uh, 
If the oil and gas stays in the ground, the global economy burns because so much of the global economy as we know it is based on oil and gas and coal. Well, um, excellent points, and it would take a long, long time to, to answer all of those. But um, if we go beyond um, the environmental factors, because obviously there is the concern about fossil fuels, but um, the reason why um, electric cars uh, are going to win is because of um, economics. Um, electricity is much cheaper than gasoline, and as I said, Tesla offered to, um, to the first uh, clients to give them free electricity f uh, for the Tesla uh, uh, cars. So it is impossible to compete with something that is against something that is free. And also we, we are reaching, as I mentioned, in half of the planet grid parity. So solar energy today in half of the planet is cheaper than fossil fuels. So economically, the battle has been won. And in the next uh, two to five years, all over the planet, even in Russia, uh, solar energy will be more competitive than fossil fuels. So it is economics at the end of the day, but about cars, uh, electric cars, uh, four things which are very interesting. As I showed, uh, the economies of scale are making them cheaper eventually than gasoline cars, number one. Number two, they have very few parts, mobile parts as opposed to the gasoline cars, so they have less maintenance. Also, they are incredibly efficient. Gasoline cars, convert at most 20% of the energy in the gasoline into movement, at most 20%. Electric cars are just the opposite. They convert more than 80% of the electricity into movement. Additionally, electricity is cheaper than gasoline. Um, so I, I think that the battle is, has been won by electric cars and there is no return. Um, for most of the new generation and for the new cars. And the old cars will be dying out. A normal car might have a life expectancy of 10 years, but after that, um, they, they are gone, I think. You didn't quite answer the question, but anyway, let us talk over the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the other question or comment? Yes, Alex, please. Question to Sarah. Uh, you mentioned that the, the markets for for new new type of education will be growing very rapidly. Who will be the major players in this market? Universities or companies, or who will play the, the key role there? Right. Um, thanks, Alex, for the questions. The major players for this ad tech market are the private sectors. Um, so the adopters are primarily the the schools, uh, the universities, uh, institutes of higher learning. Uh, but the key driver uh, of this um, uh, educational technology development, actually uh, mostly um, startups, very young companies uh, that, that are uh, introducing these new technologies. Yeah. Um, and also to, uh, to add on, um, the, the, the companies that have been more successful in driving this educational development technologies are actually people with an um, with, with a background of having been a, a, a teacher or an educator before so that they are familiar with the pedagogy and they're actually more likely to be able to take their venture to a, a more successful level compared to someone who doesn't have that background yeah okay any other question uh, sir i have a, one question to you sir uh, about your solar thing, uh, what is the end of life of the solar panels? Uh, what, what, where, what are you going to do with the when life is over of solar panel? That's one question. And India is facing the problem because if, even if uh, you said that it is less than great, uh, great price, still you are not able to achieve the target. What was the uh, target 100 gigawatt by 2022? We are not able to achieve that and probably we may not be able to achieve that. Probably we don't have any manufacturing capability in solar panel. We are dependent on China. And a question, not question, is a supplement to you because uh, to Sarah, because uh, in I, I I request you to go through the technology roadmap for education sector we have prepared uh, for India, <laughs> and where uh, technology is in different age group and different readiness level we have mapped it. You can go through in our, from our site website. Uh, that will be a good document to, to correlate with your uh, uh, roadmap. It's a nice document. So 
So that's what I want to talk about this uh, solar thing in in terms of India perspective. So. Okay. Okay. Just a moment. Uh, is that question? Okay, <laughs> Actually, gonna ask Sarah again. <laughs> so, following this uh, very um, strong trends of like uh, e-learning and uh, mobile learning and other technologies, um, how would you see the future of education and future of higher um, education institutions? What they would look like? Um, probably, uh, this will have a lot of impacts on uh, the way uh, education is delivered. And even to, for the architecture of the, you know, schools and universities and things, whether we will need like massive big campuses or we'll need smaller and more distributed spaces and for what and those sort of things. So I'm just doing some brainstorming based on <laughs> what you said. Yeah, uh, thanks, Okchun. Yeah, thanks for uh, always asking very forward-looking kind of uh, scenarios. I, uh, for uh, Based on our study, we think that certainly uh, M-learning and E-learning uh, are channels that uh, schools need to provide for. Um, and so far, um, you know, the, the traditional way of doing um, this is just a recording, making a, a recorded video of the lecturers and just beaming it across. So, but I think in the future, um, the uh, there is a greater demand for um, adaptive learning meaning that um, the, the level of the content as well as the assessment uh, is actually centered around the learner and, and the learner actually gets um, a very up-to-date feedback of uh, where exactly he's doing, how he's doing also how much more he needs to clear. Uh, for instance, from the day he enrolled into the university to the day he, he graduate, he may have like a portable pass, a passport with him. And this passport will actually tell him where his strengths are and where his areas of improvement are and may recommend certain courses, certain electives. Uh, they are uh, either in the university or outside in other universities that could help enhance his learning journey. So, so that he will have an overall, um, you know, uh, um, a uh, very clear vision of where he's heading, that's one. And second also uh, is also about um, the, the simulation, um, the thing part will be much stronger because uh, it will allow him to be able to, uh, you know, do it in a fun way, in an immersive way. Thank you. Um, okay, in terms of um, Indians, uh, India's plan, uh, well, maybe it was um, uh, too big to begin with, uh, but there is a very famous futuristic law called Amara's Law that also Bill Gates likes to quote that we tend to uh, overestimate in the short term and underestimate in the long term. Um, I don't know if India will fulfill its goals, but in the biggest scheme of things, it is kind of irrelevant because I showed that the exponential curve of solar growth, it, it's fantastic for three decades, absolutely beautiful. And countries had been changing. One of the first countries going solar actually was Spain because it has a lot of so, uh, sunshine, right? Then Japan came in, then the USA came in, then Germany came in, now China is coming in. India will come in at some point. Maybe the next one will be Ethiopia. I do not know, but overall, worldwide, the exponential keeps on going and we believe this will continue. And solar um, production is doubling every two years. Right now it's about 2%. So think about this, Let, let's do the experiment. Every two years it doubles now. So right now it's uh, one and a half, next year it will be 2%, okay? Uh, last year it was above 1%. So 2% in 2020, 2022, 4%, 2024, uh, 8%, uh, 2026, 16%, 2018, 32%, 2020, 64%. Basically, we go all uh, solar. Uh, it might not happen that fast. I think it will because we have reached grid parity in half of the planet, and we will reach grid parity even in Russia soon. So economically speaking, all new production will have to be solar because it is cheaper. It is cheaper to have new production. Again, it is true, and maybe related to Joe's comment, uh, that there is a some cost on other technologies, and even coal and things like that. But for all new energy production, will be solar. The same in the USA. Donald Trump, he said he would protect the coal uh, companies. All the coal companies in the USA since Trump won have gone bankrupt. And not because Trump wanted them to go bankrupt. He wanted to do the opposite. But economically, they cannot compete today. They can't. 
even with Trump behind them. So it is a matter of economics. Grid parity has been reached. There is no turning back. And it, the same with gasoline cars. Gasoline cars are dead in 10 years. And again, this is what we teach in Stanford in Singularity University. And, and I see it so clear, and we were talking about Elon Musk. I have met Elon Musk. This guy is a visionary. He talks about going to Mars in 10 years. He says that the gasoline cars are dead. And, and I believe it because I have seen uh, uh, what has happened in the last 10 years. And the other thing that I want you to think about, look at the projections of the International Energy Agency. How can they be so wrong for 20 years? How can they be so stupid? I mean, I, I would like to see the projections in Russia. I don't know how they are, but the International Energy Agency in Paris and the U.S. Department of Energy in Washington have been constantly incredibly wrong doing just linear thinking. When solar energy has been proven, I have showed the data, grown exponentially for three decades, and still they don't get it. Okay, uh, I think... <laughs> We should stop it, <laughs> and uh, because uh, I'm also in charge of the energy issue in Japan, so I have uh, many comments, but uh, I'm so thirsty, so I should finish this session. Okay, thank you very much for everybody. Okay, so let's finish this session three. So then session four will start at the 3.40, okay? And you will be talking in Japan. <laughs> 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 Japan is number one in solar power about 20 years ago. We have a, yes, but we have a very big trouble now. <laughs>